Thank you very much. Um, just first the first check. Uh, I know they've had a few issues with the audio today. Can people hear me? People at the back, give me a wave. Hey, someone right at the back, give me a wave. Excellent. Um, I'm Mike Lehan. I'm a software engineer, uh, CTO of a student prop tech startup, um, a northerner, and a skydiver. We can talk about that later at the bar. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at M1KE. Um, the cloud has produced a really great new way for people to leak your personal data to random strangers. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to uh, today, talk to you about today, is um, how you can find out whether the cloud is leaking random data to strangers. And if you are responsible for managing that cloud, how you can prevent it. Um, this is going to be focused around AWS. Um, and it is relatively entry level. So if you come in here as a sort of hardened AWS pen tester, there might not be much new for you today. But what hopefully you would get is an idea of some resources that you could use to train other people um, in AWS uh, security. Um, this is going to use a platform called Floors.Cloud, uh, which is set up by a security researcher called Scott Piper of Summit Root Consulting, um, who's very kindly let me use uh, his resource in this talk today. Um, these principles are directly around AWS. However, if you are responsible for managing infrastructure on Google Cloud Platform or Azure, a lot of the same principles are likely to apply. They might be presented differently. Uh, there might be different interfaces and different patches and holes that people have fixed over the time. But essentially, the uh, core features of how you manage access and how users can inadvertently give the wrong people access will generally be consistent. And Floors.Cloud is presented as a uh, sort of training exercise, similar to like a CTF. So if you've ever done CTFs, uh, either competitively or just uh, practice websites that teach you various skills in uh, testing or hacking, then you're probably familiar with the format. Uh, Floors is in six parts, so uh, I'm going to go through each part of the Floors program. The best thing about this, hopefully, is that it means that after this talk, you can go away and do this yourself. Um, you could try and follow along. A lot of the things I'm going to be doing are uh, quite complicated to just do manually. It involves a lot of uh, messing around in the console, in your browser, or typing commands in CLI. Uh, so if you tried to follow along, you'd have to just be really fast, which uh, you might not all be in the mood for after a heavy carb lunch. Um, so this talk has been recorded. The slides will be available immediately as soon as I finish uh, on the B-Sides website. Um, so I encourage you to listen and watch what I'm doing, and then afterwards go and try to site yourself. Especially if you've never used AWS before, it's a really great introduction to how you can start doing some basic testing and securing of AWS resources. So challenge number one, web hosting and public permissions. The challenge is presented like this. Um, each time I'm going to present the challenge, it gives a URL, um, which is going to be helpful if you look at the slides later, um, and the description on the website. So this level is buckets of fun. See if you can find the first subdomain. So this is presented like a traditional sort of CTF hint. Um, and you need to know a few principles about AWS's storage platform for this. S3 is Amazon's simple storage service. It was not their first uh, service they released, but it definitely was the one that propelled AWS into uh, the use of lots of companies. Um, and to this day, it's one of their most successful and most used services. Um, it stands for Simple Storage Service, um, and the principal uh, part of S3 is the bucket. Um, a bucket is essentially your area for storing some sort of files online. Uh, a key thing is bucket, buckets are geographically located. So I can have a bucket in London, you can have a bucket in West Virginia, um, and that plays a part. However, despite the fact that buckets are unique to a region, their host names, the name of the bucket, is globally unique. And this is going to be important in a moment. Um, finally, an object is basically a file. Um, it's a file along with some metadata. And so everything in AWS refers to buckets and objects rather than uh, folders and files. Um, an object can have slashes in its name, which sort of makes like a pseudo file file structure. But it's not really, it's really AWS's buckets are flat and you just happen to be putting slashes in your object names. Um, that's not hugely important for the work we're going to do today. Um, web hosting has become one of the most popular uses of S3. S3 allows you to click a button in the console and host a website directly from S3. Um, and one of the key things about that is this bucket having globally unique names. Your bucket is in a region. For websites, your bucket name must match the address of your website. So if you want to host google.com from a bucket, you need to have a bucket called google.com. And only one AWS account in the world can own a bucket called google.com. <coughs> Um, now, obviously, to host a website called Google.com, you also need Google's name servers, which they're probably not going to give you to test it. Um, but if you wanted to do this, you can do that. It leads to a slightly strange domain squatting issue where you can sort of predict domains that might want to host an S3 in future and just take their domain names. Uh, I mean, that's just kind of a dick move, but maybe you'll want to have some fun with someone you know setting up a company and you can sell the bucket back to them or something. Um, all S3 websites are also accessible at this longer URL at the bottom of the slide. Bucket name, 
s 3 website region amazonaws.com So for example, if you were hosting google.com from an AWS bucket, it would be googlecom s 3 website say you're in London EU-West-2.amazonaws.com. And this is pretty useful for research. So floors.cloud is itself hosted as an S3 static website. And so the first challenge has told us we want to find something to do with their bucket. We can run uh, dig to find an A record for floors.cloud, which gives us an IP address. By running NS lookup on the IP address, we find that it's S3 website US West 2. Great. We know now that there is a bucket called floors.cloud, and it's hosted in the region US West 2. And so now we have this ability to find what's in the bucket. But obviously that doesn't give us access straight away. Or does it? AWS have a really great command line tool. And the idea is you have an account, you install the command line tool, and you log in with your account, and you do stuff on your account. But the command line tool isn't fully restricted to using your own account. It can be used anonymously. You can simply tell it, don't look for my account credentials, use any credentials you want. Um, and so we can do a simple uh, lookup in S3 to check for this bucket using ls, which is very familiar for anyone who uses a Unix system. Um, so ls, S3, protocol, floors, cloud, and then this no sign request parameter, which says, don't give any credentials along with this request. I'm totally anonymous. Um, the weird thing is people can accidentally block uh, authenticated users, but not anonymous users, because AWS. Um, and in this case, we see secret and a hash. And that's the way the rest of these levels will work. We'll find a secret page. And when we browse that secret page, we will get told, you found a secret file. Go on to the next level. The mitigation of this is that when you enable website uh, access, S3 adds a policy. Now, these policies are used to control access to all resources in AWS, not just S3. Um, so if you want to use AWS a lot, you're going to have to learn their policy language. Uh, it's known as IAM, Identity Access Management, and the policies have this very similar format in JSON. So they add that policy to you so that anyone can access your website. What a lot of people do, though, is they panic and go, oh, my website's not working, because they enable the policy and they instantly try and view their website. And it, it can take a few seconds. So then they go to this page, and they say, oh, look, there's an access control listing, and I need to allow everyone to list my objects. And at this point, you've exposed the entirety of your bucket publicly, which means even things that aren't linked in your web route could be accessed by anyone using the AWS command line tool. Um, we'll see why that could be properly dangerous a bit later. So we're on to challenge number two. Um, and this uses the access control list as well. So again, we've got the level ID at the top there. For if you're following this on the slides later, you can just jump straight to a level and cheat your way through this. Um, and we say the level is similar with a slight twist, but you're going to need your own AWS account. Setting up your own AWS account is pretty helpful if you want to be testing AWS for someone else. Um, obviously, if you're running on AWS, you will have an AWS account. But if you're testing stuff, it might be helpful to have a separate account for running your testing in. Um, and I would definitely recommend splitting out AWS accounts for different purposes wherever possible. Um, when you create an AWS account, you get given root credentials. Um, as is standard practice, don't use your root credentials for everyday access. You can create a user, and you can give it an admin access policy, or you can give it a more specific policy to what you're doing. I'm not going to cover that here, because I could do an entire talk just on setting up your initial AWS account. Um, there are plenty of tutorials online to do that. The key thing here is you generate an access key. You'll see a security key for it, and you can insert this into the console. So if you go into AWS and type configure, you can give it a profile name. So let's say you're doing this after the talk. You want to type profile besides 19 and then put in your access key and secret key. And now you can run uh, as that user and that account for the work you're doing here. And it won't affect any other AWS accounts that you happen to be running with on your system. Um, and you can put in a default region. US West 2 is good for this exercise because everything is hosted in US West 2 for this exercise. And now we can simply do the same thing we did last time, but now with our own profile. And oh, look. If we'd run this with no sign request, we'd have gotten access denied. But suddenly, even though we're not the account that owns the bucket, we can see all the files. And once again, we get on to the next level. The reason for this is a canned access control list. Amazon have a set of canned access control lists. How easily can you see that there? You should be able to see it relatively easily. Um, and the different access control lists can be applied to a bucket or an object to allow different levels of user, certain accounts, certain uh, groups of users, things like the AWS log delivery system, access to your buckets. Um, can details are great for quickly setting up buckets and, and easy security fencing, but they're also great for not quite understanding what they do. Um, for example, this CAND ACL um, is about authentication. So the owner gets full access, and authenticated users get full access. So to me, an authenticated user means an authenticated user of my system. So if I set up a bucket and give it this uh, ACL, I expect other users in my AWS account can access it. 
AWS's language is slightly ambiguous here. Authenticated user means any user of AWS in the world. And at this point, you apply what looks like a secure policy to your bucket, and anyone with an AWS account, which is free to set up, can go and view your bucket. Um, this was easy to apply in older versions of the console. They have removed that now because it was such a big flaw, but it's still possible to apply in the command line. Um, and a lot of old tools that kind of create S3 buckets for you and do like a load of setup for some sort of uh, data storage, maybe for something like WordPress as a, a content management system storage area, may still use the old ACLs. So do check when you're installing these whether they have these ACLs attached. Okay, on to number three. A whole new way to expose Git. Once again, we have the URL there, and this is similar to the previous levels, but we're going to find an AWS key. AWS keys are really the bread and butter of any sort of attempt to hack or test AWS accounts. If you have a key, you can probably do something that someone doesn't want you to do. Um, we can do the same thing we did in challenge one. So we go on and we list the contents of the bucket with no sign request. This pre symbol that appears in our command line output is a prefix. So even though they don't technically have directory structures, they will tell you, this is a prefix, you can look inside it. And here's a prefix called .git. Ah, hello. What do you reckon's happened here? Well, some poor soul has uploaded their .git file. Let's pull it down to our system. We extract it using S3 sync. <laughs> and now we find out we're in a regular git repository and we can run git log. We see some commits, we see the first commit, and then we see another commit. Oh, I've added something I shouldn't have done. Using Git, we can now check out what's in that first commit that the second one undid. So, going to check it out, and we're going to run ls. Oh, look, access keys.txt. Probably more regularly named than it would be in a real scenario. Um, and now we have an AWS access key and secret key. Let's check if it's still valid. We run AWS configure with a new profile name, so we can keep sort of ramping these up and store them as we go to continue our test. Um, and then we can run some commands as this key. So let's list all the buckets on this account. And we see a bucket called level four. Well done, we're on to the next level. Now, another vulnerability was needed to expose this problem. They already had this open bucket. But actually, if you're building a website, a static website, what's the likelihood that you'll simply sync your entire directory up to AWS? Now, the AWS sync command ignores dot .files by default uh, until you add a whitelist include or, what, or blacklist exclude flag, at which point if you add an exclude flag, it will then include everything you didn't exclude, which can include your .git file directory. Um, and so now you've synced your .git directory to your web server, and that access key might just be used for this simple static site. People use static sites a lot in business for something like uh, a marketing, short-term marketing campaign. How likely is the marketing department to roll their keys regularly? How likely are you to have just given them a key that has way more access than it needed to for them to run their marketing campaign? You know, you got that email from them, oh, this isn't working again, and you throw your toys down and you just add admin access to them for the, for the week, you say. I'll, I'll take it off at the end of the week, and then life happens and suddenly your key's being exposed. Um, you can look at this and go, oh, it's all hypothetical. This happened to Instagram. Um, it was reported as Instagram's million dollar bug because Instagram's uh, security team famously said they would pay a million dollar bug bounty if one was found. Um, spoiler alert, they didn't pay the bounty. Uh, instead, they sent the FBI after the person that found it. Um, uh, so Google that one, you can find a really good write-up on it. Uh, eventually, they, they paid a bit of money. Um, but make sure to ignore .git files, but also don't commit your credentials in the first place. This is sort of security 101. Credentials don't exist in version control um, or just anywhere near something you're deploying. And if credentials are exposed, don't just do a commit and hope no one notices. Um, re roll the credentials, recreate them. And that's another good reason to use separate credentials for everything you do. Because if you expose your prod credentials on some random marketing website and you need to roll them and they're the same credentials, now prod has to go down whilst you fix your credential issue. So separate credentials for every use case is a really good lesson from this as well. <coughs> We're going to learn to break into servers by cloning their hard disks. This is something you couldn't do before the cloud. Um, so once again, we have a level URL, and you're going to get access to an EC2 running at this very long subdomain. And we're told that a snapshot was made of this EC2 instance right before Nginx was set up on it. Let's go over some jargon. EC2 is Elastic Compute Cloud, basically Amazon's VPS offering. And a snapshot is a full copy of a disk 
stored in S3. Now, unlike a lot of things in S3 buckets, you can't access it through the regular S3 command line, uh, but it is essentially in S3. Um, and that means it's inherent to a lot of the sharing and access resources that S3 is vulnerable to. Um, and EBS is Elastic Block Store, basically hard disks. Uh, ADRFs have to give an acronym to everything they do. So hard disks become EBS, uh, etc. Um, but after a while, you learn to just speak in acronyms, and you sound really clever when you talk to someone who doesn't know what you're on about. Um, snapshots are often made public to transfer them between accounts. So I want to move my account that's doing everything. I've got one account. It's doing prod, staging, dev, marketing, testing, analytics, all this sort of stuff. I'm hosting some random cat photos in there for my wife. Um, and actually, I decide maybe that's not a good idea. I want to move to multiple accounts and make a sensible structure for my organization. Um, but that means that all my images that are built for my servers need to be transferred. There are ways to do this that involve changing permissions on both sides and using interesting command line tools. The other way to do this is to go into your snapshots and tick make public and then send the URL to someone else. Um, this is a common way people transfer snapshots. And guess how many people forget to untick the make public box afterwards? Um, to find out snapshots on an account, all you need to do is know the account ID. So let's go back to our hacked credentials from before. And we can use this get caller identity command. This is really handy for when you're testing. If you find some keys, the first thing you want to do is run this. Um, this will tell you who you are. And I know the account ID now of someone who I can look for uh, EC2 snapshots. And so now, as anyone, not just as the uh, user there, I can do it as my own account. I can check for snapshots owned by that account ID. And I'm putting here region US West 2 just in faint because you might not need it if you've configured it the right way. But I often add the region just to make sure I'm in the right place. It'd be rubbish to be doing a test and you admit the region one time and you, you totally miss something that's blatant and obvious. Um, so always try and be verbose in, in anything you're doing if you're testing. Um, and look, we've got a snapshot. Snap ID, really long hash. And hey, it's not encrypted. That's good news for us. So we can now do this. This is a long procedure. This will take you probably 10, 15 minutes if you try and do it yourself. I'm not going to do it in front of you because that will take up all the rest of the time I have. Um, and so I'm just going to walk through what you do. Go and try this yourself. It's quite interesting. Um, you create a volume using a snapshot ID. So a new EBS volume, new hard disk. And then you create a new EC2 instance and you give it your own key to log into. So when you create an instance, you can give it a key. Even if you're using someone else's hard disk image, you can give it a key, and AWS will just inject that key into the system for you. Um, so therefore, you can always log in, even if it's using someone else's disk image. Um, you sign it into that key, and then you mount this extra volume you've added to it. Um, the commands for mounting differ per OS, but you, you should be able to find those out fairly easily. Um, and so we're on this disk. We've got our instance. We can SH into it because it's our instance. This isn't anyone else's system now. The nice thing here as well is that once you're exploiting a snapshot, anything you do on here isn't likely to hit the original target. So you can do quite destructive things testing here to find out whether there be vulnerabilities in the original server. Um, and look, we found a file, setup-nginx.sh. Again, probably well better name than any of the files you tend to use. You know, attempt3.sh.back. Um, and so let's have a look what's in it. And we have a HT password command that's setting up a HT password file in uh, our nginx setup. And as you may expect, we can now browse to the original URL and we enter our username and password for HTTP basic auth and we get the link to floors level five. Um, where's our mitigation for this? Don't open snapshots to the public unless that's your goal. Um, if it is your goal, I'm quite wondering what you're doing, but also be careful. The process of creating a disk image is very different from the process of writing some sort of provisioning file. Because when you write a provisioning file, you know exactly what's in it. You can read it. When you're creating a disk image, you're not always certain what credentials you've entered at some point that might be stored in a .bash history file, stored in the temp directory, stored in logs. Um, so if you do want to make an EC2 and share it publicly for some reason, really check how you've built that and make sure there's nothing sensitive on it. When you are sharing, share with one specific account. So you can do this. It's a bit more complicated, but if you know someone else's account ID to transfer an EC2 instance, you can share the account. A final way is to encrypt snapshots. When AWS encrypts a disk snapshot, you need two permissions to access that snapshot. One, permission to look at the snapshot, which we had because it was public. But the second thing is permission to use the key that encrypts that snapshot. And keys are much harder to accidentally grant access to someone else. You have to go and say, I want to give this person access to my key. Um, and the nice thing is, if someone gets your disk snapshot, which is public, and tries to decrypt it without access to your key, you'll get a message in your logs saying, hey, someone tried to use your key. They didn't get in. But they tried to use it. And now you know someone's trying to venture into your system and take your disk snapshots, which means you can firstly make them private 
And secondly, you know you've got someone targeting you. Uh, that might be a pen test you've employed, and at which point you can say, hey, we're aware of this. Or it might be someone malicious. So be aware of that. Exposing credentials via a proxy. This is a fun one. Um, this EC2 has a simple HTTP-only proxy on it. And there's an example, running neversl.com through a proxy. Um, running open proxies isn't something most people tend to do, but it's something people can do accidentally for other reasons. Um, and to exploit this, we need to know about the EC2 metadata instance. Um, every EC2 instance has a server running locally to it, which can be hit on 169.254, 169.254. If you hit the server with a HTTP request, you get a really long list of uh, commands and information about the server that you're currently on. Um, AWS use this, but also Google Cloud Platform use this, same IP address. Azure use this, same IP address, to uh, host uh, information about the server that you're running on, um, which can include loads of random pointless details, but also can include things like security credentials. Um, this is useful for the system because it means that if I'm writing an application to run on EC2, uh, my application doesn't need to find credentials or have its own credentials to access AWS services. I can simply provision an instance with a role that allows uh, that instance to do something on AWS, say create a new S3 bucket or put a file in it. Um, and that's a really handy way to limit your security because your instances and your code base doesn't have access keys in it anymore. Um, but we have an open proxy on this system. So let's curl it. Um, so we're curling pro the floors cloud address slash proxy and the metadata server. And as you might have expected with my long preamble, we get into it. Um, the first set of uh, listings you get is API versions. Um, each time they add new things, they, they roll the versions so that they don't break old things which don't expect certain things to be there or certain formats. Um, but you can generally just use latest if you're testing. Um, what's available in our latest? Uh, so we have a whole list of things. But you'll hopefully notice one right in the middle on the uh, left-hand column there um, that says, I am Identity Access Management. Um, and predictably... If we go into it, we get an access key and a secret key. We also get a token, and that's interesting because this is using not an AWS user account or group, but a role. Um, and the reason it's using a role is because that's how instances are given permissions. Roles work slightly differently to users. A user has an access key and secret key, they can just access AWS with any time. Um, a role uses its access and secret key to generate a short term Anywhere from sort of 15 minutes up to, I think, 40, 48 hours is now the limit. It might have changed. Um, key that can then be used in perpetuity for that time to do things. Um, so therefore, if you want to exploit this, you can't just save the access key and secret access key. And your token will only be valid for a certain amount of time before it expires. So if you get hold of this, you have a time limit now on your further test with it, unless you can just go back and abuse the proxy a second time. Um, so we're going to put these into our... Um, AWS credentials, but we have to add an extra field. We have to edit this AWS credentials file where we add the name of our profile with that we've put the access key and secret key into, and then add this session token. Um, and you can use the STS get core identity feature and other features to find out how long you have. So if the person is smart, their session token might only last 15 minutes. That limits what you can do in that time. Um, and hopefully by that point, they've spotted in the logs that someone's hit their proxy. At the end of the day, if they're not monitoring it though, you can just keep getting a token again and again and again and keep exploiting them. It doesn't matter what time limit's on it. Um, so let's use these credentials now. And predictably, we get a address to another file in this directory. And we can go on to level six. Um, what's our mitigation here? Don't run proxies would be my number one thing. Um, the chances that you need a publicly accessible web server running a proxy that can proxy any website on the internet is pretty low. Um, maybe you have use cases. I would love to hear about them. Uh, but in general, if you can help it, don't run proxies through public accessible web servers. Um, if you do need to, use a whitelist of allowed proxy domains. You probably don't need to proxy the entire internet, unless that's literally your point of your service. You can specifically block the metadata IP in your proxy, or you can use a WAF to block any request that comes in with that uh, IP string in it. Do be aware that various exploits exist for a lot of common WAFs that people can find weird ways to encode a string so that the WAF doesn't see it, but it still goes to the proxy eventually. So you're sort of uh, walking on eggshells at the point where you're trying to block certain IP addresses from being entered in query strings or, or headers. Um, so the nuclear option is you can use root tables on your instance to block anything on the system accessing the metadata service. This will also hose any application on the system that relies on the metadata service existing to get credentials. It's not that useful, but I guess if you were running an ECU server that was doing nothing with anything else on AWS, this would work for you. 
Um, I don't generally recommend it. But our final uh, point here is the insecure security audit. I'm always very suspicious of anything being given out with the word security in it that turns out to be insecure. Um, that seems to be this kind of false confidence thing um, that generally leads to people ignoring the thing with the word security in it because, oh, that must be secure. We'll look at all the other things. Um, so, for this final challenge, you're going to get a user access key. So you're going to have to make another new account with this user access key and secret key. Um, and you've been told by the challenge that it has a policy called security audit. Security audit sounds very formal and very nice. Ah, I can audit some security with this policy. Um, that's really useful. Um, this exploits a very common thing in AWS, which is the canned policy. AWS have a load of managed policies that they provide to do certain things in AWS, like the admin access one, which just grants you access to everything. Um, and you generally, if you give someone admin access, you sort of know what you're getting into. But if you give someone something called security audit, you'd expect, oh, they can, they can audit my account that it's secure. But that's, that's the end of it, right? That, that's not a hugely important account. Um, and there's a number of AWS policies that have this kind of risk. Um, the most common thing they do is that they need S3 access at some point. So they need to put some files in S3 to work properly. And what they do to do that is they just grant full access to S3. Um, which is great for listing buckets and things, but now if you're storing your database backups in S3, that policy also allows anyone to download your database backups. Chances are even your security auditor probably doesn't want to be given access to your database backups um, or anything else that's sensitive in S3. They only want to be able to get at things that they are auditing. They're probably not auditing the content of all your files that you're storing there. Um, overly permissioned are, is, uh, policies are just very common. Um, another key one is the session manager policy. If you are using session manager at all, if anyone knows AWS and is using that, um, the default session manager policy is insecure. Um, and if you're using it on a role, that role has way too much access to S3. Uh, go and find a better one. Uh, contact AWS support. They will give you a better policy for that. Um, so let's have a look specifically at security audit. This is a canned policy which allows examination of resources in an account. Um, it allows viewing policy content. And here's a key thing for privilege escalation. Um, if you get an account and access key, the next thing you need to do is know what your account has access to. By default, AWS doesn't tell you that. And there's a reason for it. Because now if you start suddenly trying to list buckets and you can't, that pops up in the logs of whoever owns the account. Hey, someone's using this key and is trying to list buckets, but they're, not being, they're being blocked. And now you know that someone's obtained a key to your system that they're trying to use maliciously. If a user can find out what policies are attached to their account, they now know exactly what actions they can or can't perform. Now, that might mean that they can't perform any decent actions, but it also means they can now evade detection for anything else they do in future. You now have no way to find out if that user uh, is doing anything malicious. So say you've granted one of your regular team members security audit along with a few other permissions. Someone now gets into their account and using a security audit, they can find out who they are and what they can do that won't raise alarm bells. And now any other permissions that user has are open to them, and they can find out anything they can work on in your system. Um, so this is a classic route to privilege escalation. Once you know someone's policies, you probably know way more about their organization than you need to, and you can work your way up from there. And it also allows you to enumerate things like users. Um, and obviously, if you find a username, you can then go and check a publicly available database of leaked passwords for that username, and maybe you get in that way. Um, to actually exploit this on floors.cloud is really long. Um, it takes lots of individual steps, and each one's quite complex. None of them really have anything to do with security. They're more to do with specific resources that exist in AWS. So I encourage you really to go and try and do this yourself with what you've learned. Um, but if you do do it, you'll get through to the end of floors.cloud. In summary, you want to roll credentials regularly. This is a general practice that you should be applying everywhere. But AWS credentials generally hold the keys to the kingdom for most companies running on AWS. Um, roll them regularly. Uh, roll them immediately if you suspect they've been compromised. And check out AWS Vault for secure credential storage. Apply a least privilege on IAM entities. Any user, role, group, anyone that's access AWS, find out what they need to do. Don't give them admin and then decide to restrict it later, because later is too late. You won't know what they're using. You'll block them from certain things. Production websites stop working. Add policies one at a time. Add permissions one at a time. Find out if the user can do what they need to do, and then stop. S3 has released a new public uh, block public access feature in the last few months. Um, I would advise you using those. If you don't know a bucket needs to be public, click the big block public access. What this does is override policies and access control lists on that bucket permanently. Um, 
but still understand what's under the hood, because sometimes you might need certain bits of buckets to be public, and these kind of nuclear solutions will break things for you. Finally, if you're a pen tester, check buckets, find creds, and examine policies, and hopefully you're going to get somewhere and get your report done or your bounties claimed. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I am not available for questions because I've used all my time, but I'm going to stand in the hallway out there if anyone wants to talk to me, and I'll be at the after party as well. Boom. Um, you can check out uh, the slides, which will be on this URL here, um, as soon as I get outside. Uh, tweet me uh, if you like this, if you didn't like this, if you have complaints, if I misled you with the title. Um, and check out OG AWS on Slack. It's a great group, really great security uh, channel um, as well in that. So come and talk to people, be nice, ask questions. Uh, thanks again to Scott Piper um, for providing Floors.Cloud. Um, and there is now Floors 2. Uh, if anyone wants to go further with this, uh, hopefully I'll be doing a talk on that next year. Thank you very much.